And the Buddha set out the Four Noble Truths. He made it very clear that the purpose of the path was to attack the problem of suffering at its cause. In other words, you don't attack the suffering, you attack the craving. And the attack has two forms. One is developing and the other is abandoning, restraining. But it's interesting that in the three main divisions of the path, we have virtue, concentration, and discernment. Under virtue, everything is about abstaining. And yet the path requires that you develop certain qualities of mind that we would call virtues in English. Things like integrity, heedfulness, honesty. The Buddha says those are prerequisites for the path. So they're there. It's simply that they're not listed under virtue. Virtue is mainly abstaining. As John Mahabhu says in one place, it's offense against the unruliness of your heart in terms of as is expressed in your words and your deeds. And concentration is offense against the unruliness of your heart as is expressed in the heart itself. There's part of us that doesn't like that sense of restraint. We feel like we're being hemmed in. After all, that is an image of leaving home life, which is dusty and crowded and cramped. You come into the open air of the practice, but in the open air. You have to be careful about what you do and don't do. This is where the quality of heedfulness comes in. We talked the other night about John Sow staying in a malarial jungle and being very careful about not leaving his mosquito net at certain hours of the day, not drinking the water unless he had boiled it. But a lot of the John's talk about when you go into the forest, there are a lot of things beyond just malaria that you have to be careful about. A lot of ways you have to keep restrained. And John Fung told an interesting story one time. He was staying up in northern Thailand with another monk. And he had a sense that the spirits of the place where they were staying were extremely strong. So he was very careful not to say anything more than was absolutely necessary. One day he, he and the other monk went on an arms round. And one of the people putting alms in their bowls asked the other monk a question. And the monk responded. And something inside of John Frunk said, there was no need to answer that question. And sure enough, later in the day, the monk got really sick. So we think about the Ajans out in the forest. Part of us thinks about all the freedom. But then you get to the forest and there are certain rules. And John Fung said when you go in the forest, one thing you avoid is a rubber plantation because the trees exude a bad vapor at night. You stay in there for a long time, you get sick. Other forests, as I said, have spirits and they can be very unfriendly. They can take offense at all kinds of things. So he's always very strict about what you should and shouldn't do. When I stayed in an old building we had there, which we called an ordination hall, it wasn't really an ordination hall, but it looked like one. He made it very clear that if anyone came into the hall at any time of the day when I was not sleeping, they shouldn't be able to see any of my stuff, so I had to keep it all hidden away. And they could bring it out only when I used it and had to put it back. All this was to teach the quality of restraint. Because after all, what are the causes of suffering? It's the cravings of the mind, which is the forest of John Sayer, things that flow out of the mind. And you've got to cut the flow. 
And so when your mind flows toward unskillful behavior, you've got to cut the flow. This, of course, is based on the realization the mind is not innately good. The practice is not simply a matter of letting our innate goodness shine out. The mind is innately changeable. It's capable of all kinds of things. And it can change very fast. So you always have to be on the lookout. This is what heedfulness is for. You've got to watch out for the mind's own tendency to change. Make sure it doesn't change into something really bad. So you have the precepts to hold us in. The principles of not just the five precepts, but also the principles of restraint of the senses. Then we come to meditation. And again, you have your ancestral territory where you should stay while you meditate, and then there are the areas outside where you shouldn't go, like that image of the monkeys in the Himalayas. There's some areas where only monkeys go, other areas where only human beings go, and then there are areas where both monkeys and human beings go. And those are the dangerous areas for the monkeys, because they can get caught there. So the wise monkey will stay in the area that only monkeys go. And here your ancestral field is the body in and of itself, just taken on its own terms. Feelings, mental states in and of themselves, before they turn into becomings. So you've got to hold them back. You look at the Buddha's analysis in Dependent Core Rising, and soon after ignorance comes fabrication, and after fabrication comes consciousness, and then there's name and form. These are just physical events. Form is your sense of the body as you feel it from within. Name is a whole collection of mental events, feelings, perceptions, acts of attention, acts of intention, contact among these things. Without any reference to whose they are. When they first arise, that's what they are. They're just events. And then we turn them into worlds and we turn them into ourselves and create becomings out of them. This is why the formula for right mindfulness is putting aside greed and distress, or part of the formula is putting aside greed and distress with reference to the world. You don't want any reference to the world in here. Because once there's a world, then there's going to be something in the world that you want, and you're going to take on an identity to get it. So the, the narrative of you as a person, the cosmology of the world, these are all constructs that come after the name and the form. We're trying to get back to just those raw materials as we're meditating. So when a feeling comes, it's just a feeling. Any narrative around what kind of person am I having feelings like this, or, or this is a feeling that I really would like to get into, those kinds of narratives you've got to drop. Because as soon as you get into the narratives, you, you get ignorant about what you're doing, and wherever there's ignorance, there's going to be suffering. Whereas if you can see these things simply as events, You've got the breath element here filling the body. Just be with just breath element, without thinking about whose breath element it is. You can breathe in ways that give rise to a sense of pleasure, and you don't have to think about whose pleasure it is. It's good enough just that it's pleasure. Then you develop mind states that can stay here, mindfulness, alertness. Analysis of qualities, that's what you use for your evaluation. Just leave these things on that level. And you find there's a great lightness. You're not clamping down on things. It's, this is this world and it has these things and it has these things that I want. There's This is who I am. 
the, all the complexities of that question of who am I, what kind of person I've been in the past. Just put those aside. If you see them forming, zap them. So if you want to attack the problem of suffering at its cause, you have to watch out for this tendency of the mind to flow into these things. We're not going along with the flow here. We're going against it, cutting through the flow. And the paradox is that you confine the mind to this level. There's a greater feeling of spaciousness, ease, lightness. It's when the mind is free to roam around. That's when things get clamped down, things get heavy. Because you're dragging around all your narratives. But here you can put them aside. They don't have to confine you. So the sense of confinement that comes with restraint is for the purpose of freedom. Because after all, what are you confining? You're confining your greed, aversion, and delusion. Things that should be confined. You might make a comparison with being in a countryside that's very desolate, and there's a range of mountains between you and a land that's pleasant to live in. And the mind's used to wandering around the desolate territory, and now we're saying that we're going to go to this other land, but there's only one mountain pass to get there. And you have to restrict yourself to going through the mountain pass. And the part of the mind that likes wandering around the desolate territory will say, no, no, I'll be confined. But when you're fully convinced that there's something good on the other side of the pass, then you're willing to confine yourself to the path that goes over the pass, gets to the other side. And you find there's a lot more freedom on that side than there ever was on this side. So don't regard restraint as a burden. You're restraining yourself from your unskillful habits. You're taking that flow of craving, which, as John Sawat pointed out, we tend to take as a friend. And you're beginning to see this is not your friend at all. It's pushing you and pulling you in directions you're going to regret. So we're learning to get some control over it, bring it into bounds. So we can comprehend it and get beyond it. Once we're beyond it, then we find that even though craving could flow in all directions, there's a very important direction where it can't flow at all, but it's a much more spacious direction. So we're exercising restraint for the purpose of freedom. We're narrowing down our focus for the purpose of something really large. And John Lee makes a comparison. He said the Buddha made himself big in terms of his thoughts, his words, and his deeds. But before he made himself big, he had to make himself very small. Think him out in the forest, first suffering through all those austerities. And who was there? There were just five other people who cared about him. Nobody else cared. Then there came a point where even they didn't care. He was all on his own. And as he concentrated his goodness to it was really small like that, then it exploded so that it more than encompassed the entire world. So when the restraints of the path seem onerous, when they seem to weigh you down, remind yourself it's not always going to be a weight. And also remind yourself that what in the mind objects to this weight is something you've got to look into. Ask yourself, do you really want to identify with it, or do you want to identify with the prospect of freedom that comes from getting the mind trained, getting it under control, 
keeping it within bounds, keeping it along that path that goes through the mountain pass. To get over that pass, you have to drop a lot of your extra luggage. And the lighter you travel, the better. So what is your extra luggage? All your senses are becoming, your sense of who you are, your narratives. You just let them go. Try to catch the mind right at the level of name and form. Try to restrain it there. And that's when it will open up in, into directions that you never would have anticipated. <laughs>